Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. Oh, I hope I I hate to break your uh, your hopes, Daryl, but Yerk's not with us. I just decided. Yerk's not to, on the line. No, he's not. But I have some credits, and I thought I'd just call instead. And uh, okay, um, I'm recording right now. We could do a session without Yerk. But not in okay. that, not in that regard, but in some other regard. Sure. And uh, let's I'm all see. full of ideas in my head. I bet you are. There, and Darryl. we have recorded a, a German greeting to York that <laughs> some people can still hear. Yeah. Well, if we put it up on the internet, they will. Oh, okay. That's true, but we don't have to, you know. I I don't know. We I mean, can. I'm just I'm just uh, putting it out there that we could we could wing it from here, or we could uh, formally start. Um, yes. Uh, or we can just go with what we got so far and keep going. Yeah, we sure can. So, what's on your mind, Daryl? Let's just open it straight, wide open. On my mind is that. We have a bunch of serial killers that we need to keep exposing, and we need to uh, promote some of these people that, even though Daryl may sound like a broken record sometimes, he's going to do it, and mention, uh, oh, I love that four or six video thing. I watched all six of them, and 
they're not perfect, like nothing that we can recommend. Uh, uh, we can't recommend any group or organization or ministry uh, that sells videos and that because sometimes they'll have some bad stuff mixed in with the good. And like Eric John Phelps says, Oh boy. Uh, it's not the well, truth, Daryl. We all have a yeah. little bit of Roman Catholic leaven, whether we like it or not. Oh, for sure. And, and this is the real problem is that, you know, Jesus said that you have to remove the log out of your own eye before you can remove mm-hmm. the speck out of your brothers. And 100%. This is happening so much. And, you know, I catch myself uh, too. And uh, doesn't scripture say, be angry and sin not? So, yeah, don't let the sun go down on your your anger is, is pretty much what it says. And yeah, not, I mean, we you, can be, we can be angry, yep, but we're not supposed to let it eat us up. We're not to right. carry it with us, right? Yeah. Exactly. Or it'll it's eat not us. supposed to be a burden for us to, to correct every little tiny little flaw that we find in someone else's sermon or, or, um, you know, you just simply either you bear with it and you stay with it or you leave, you know, it's your choice. Yep. You don't have to stay there and listen to the sermon when, when he's saying something you totally disagree with, just get up and leave. Right. And since you brought it up, uh, I'll mention that, um, uh, the a pastor that I pray for, I, he still puts out a lot of good stuff. I enjoy a lot of his sermon messages and that where I'm talking about uh, Pastor Mike Hoggard, I'll name the name. I think he's a he's a committed Christian. He's really a s- strong King James supporter, and he really, really promotes the Bible. He reads lots of Bible. He's, he's got a scotoma, just like we probably all, all of us probably have a scotoma somewhere, which is a blind spot, and we're not going to notice it in ourselves because it's a blind spot. Yep, that's and, right, uh, Daryl. Yep, we don't our Lord has to... created something mm-hmm. so magnificent that we're blind to our own demise. I mean, you know, none of us are perfect, right? Only Christ is. So yeah, and I'm I'm probably going to order some more uh, materials from this. Uh, let me see what it's called here. It's vid- Vision Video. It's in my neck of the woods, all the eastern part of the state, Worcester, Pennsylvania. But it, they're carrying a, uh, and we'll mention it, they're carrying a very good uh, six-video packet of uh, uh, over seven hours and 40 minutes of videos that deal with the rest. Uh-oh. I lo- Oh, no. What happened, Daryl? Daryl, are you still there? Yeah. Oh, Hello? I'm sorry. I just all of a sudden lost a connection. You were saying something about... Uh, can you can you go back a couple Luther. sentences? Yeah, yeah. I was saying about uh, they Sorry offer a tremendous uh, packet uh, of seven videos that all deal with the Reformation. I mean, for a super good price, they say here it's a retail of one hundred nineteen dollars and ninety four cents. They're offering it for twenty nine ninety nine. I hope they still are. That was about that's right a week ago. That's right, and, and you uh, sent got... me an email with that information, and I have it, and I can put it in the description box of this video for everyone. And sure, good. It's and... uh, six different DVDs, Daryl, and they're all having mm-hmm. to do with the Protestant reformers. This Martin yep. Luther movie is uh, from the 50s or 60s, was it? 1953. 1953, old black and white, and uh-huh. it's kind of like what they call a classic, and... Uh, I think the guy that plays Luther, I think, is a Frenchman. But the the bottom line is is that it's important that we yeah. know about it's the like Reformation. It's like an hour and a, hour and forty five minutes or something, right? Yeah, it's a it's a long it's a long movie, but uh, it they do a very good job. And again, yeah, there's another movie there's, on Luther too by uh, who I think. Oh boy, Joseph Finney's. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing his name yeah. right, but it's a color one, and it was in the two thousands. 2004 or something like that. Yeah, that one's really good too, but it would be great to watch the one from the 50s and contrast the two because oftentimes directors and, uh, you know, these visionaries have different ways of, Mm -hmm. of, of showing the story. And there's so many different stories. It's not just Luther. It's everyone that led up to Luther. That's the point here. 
everyone oh, yeah. that led up to Luther because Luther was just standing on that foundation that was built on all the other reformers that died and were burned alive and with their Bibles for their faith. And as you and I talked about last night, uh, also based on people that actually were in existence before the Roman Catholic Church morphed into the Roman Catholic Church. And we're talking about the Bogomils, the Paulicians, uh, the Celtic Christians that Richard Bennett uh, talks about quite a bit, uh, that evangelized most of Europe. And we're talking about Celtic Christians that went primarily out of uh, Ireland and Scotland uh, based on the real St. Patrick. Uh, that's a name that the Roman Catholic Church gave them to them, but we know that all born again Bible believing Christians are saints. But the, the key thing to note is, is that the St. Patrick that is promoted by the Roman Catholic Church is a fictionalized character kind of a morphing of a bunch of different characters through a bunch of legends and superstitious stories about him driving all the snakes out of Ireland, etc. And Richard Bennett, who was born Irish, uh, has a deep heart and love for uh, Roman Catholics, period, but uh, he has a great love for his native Ireland. And again, these Celtic Christians, and this is so important, these Celtic Christians out of, and by the way, St. Patrick was not Irish. He was captured from what would then be called the northern, a little bit northern parts of uh, then Great Britain. Uh, Roman occupied a good bit of uh, that, the Roman, uh, pagan Roman Empire occupied quite a bit of that. And of course, then the papal Roman Empire rode on the coattails of the pagan Roman Empire, but, uh, but the, the bottom line is, is that uh, Patrick and other missionaries, and again, Patrick was not Irish. Na he wasn't a native Irishman. But the, the key thing is, is he was a Bible-believing Christian who was born, as Richard Bennett says, uh, uh, many years before. He was actually operating in Ireland something like almost uh, 25 or so years or more before uh, the Roman Catholic Church sent uh, some of their people up there, and he had already set up a bunch of uh, study areas, and uh, the, he set up monasteries, but they weren't like the Roman Catholic monasteries. These were places where people could just go and learn about the Bible and get basically get a, a Bible education and uh, become missionaries. And so he and a, a number of people in Scotland, these were the Celtic Christians that evangelized most of Western Europe before the Catholic Church moved in, before they were even on the scene. And these Celtic Christians evangelized a lot of the Germanic tribes and that, the Franks in France, and they were the ones that evangelized and brought the true gospel to much of Western Europe and then the Roman Catholic Church moved in many decades later and forced these people to convert these Bible-believing Christians. They, it was convert or die, just as it was mm -hmm. in Croatia yes. uh, in 1941 through 1945. They basically gave these born-again Christians and their families, and we can all say, oh, none of them should have converted. Uh, but they, they're little, they were watching their wives hold their little babies in their hands. And, you know, and you're looking down a line and, uh, they put a hammer or something through the head of the baby skull. That's right. The woman that's standing next to your wife, holding your child. And so we can all say, oh, they shouldn't have done it, but they did maybe just to save their families and then repented and asked the Lord later. But the, the fact of the matter is, is they weren't given a choice. It was either become Roman Catholic or die. And that was the choice that, that the Roman Catholic Church moved into these areas that had been evangelized by real Bible-believing Christians who were Celtic Christians. And again, they moved in later, and they forced them as they tried to force many, and they did force some of the... Uh, 
Hussites and uh, some of the Albigenses and Waldenses to convert almost to the point today, as Richard Bennett points out, that you can go down to the city of Albi, that's from whence the Albigensian Christians came from, and you can go down there, and there's you can't find hardly a Bible-believing Christian. And it's hard to find them in a lot of the Piedmont areas and stuff in northern Italy and uh, southwestern France. It's hard to find born-again Bible-believing Christians where these, especially where the Vaudois, which are slash the Waldenses, which were not founded by Peter Waldo. By the way, the Waldenses were there maybe centuries before Peter Waldo came along. That was another Roman Catholic fable fictionalized story made up just like St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland and et cetera, et cetera, of a a morphing of a bunch of uh, fictional characters into this one Roman Catholic supposed bishop. uh, And it's, and St. Patrick was not, again, was not a Roman Catholic. He was a Bible believing Christian. He was a Celtic Christian. And, uh, that's an important thing for people to know. And now they've already pulled that uh, video off as their featured video, but they can go up on the YouTube and just type in Richard Bennett, YouTube, and then the real St. Patrick, and they'll find. Oh, sure. We could put that. a link in the description box too, Daryl. Sure. That would be great because yep. that is, a, I really love history. I love the history of the primitive church. Mm-hmm. And again, we need to realize That's that. Right. That's really, really, Christian. really critical, right right there, what you mentioned. And, you know, actually, Daryl, I just uploaded the 15th part to the book reading that uh, Tom Fress had done in, I think it was 2015, correct me if I'm wrong, but he did a, uh, a reading on Walt Stickle's uh, Mystery Babylon uh, news radio, um, which has been shut down, you know, um, and I don't need to go into any of those details, but right. uh, basically uh, he was, you know, really, really hammering down on this lecture number five. I don't know. Do you have Romanism and the Reformation handy, Daryl, in front uh, of you? Not right in front of me, but I know it's around here somewhere close because. Well, if you, if on you are board. on the computer there, what you could do is go to uh, type in archive.org, Romanism in the Reformation. Yeah. I think if you, if you just type in uh, archive, O-R-G, Romanism in the Reformation, it might just show up in the search. I'm not sure. Yeah. But if you got a second, maybe you could do that, because in Lecture 5, Lecture five is the interpretation and use of the prophecies in pre-Reformation times. And um, it's really interesting here because... I'm holding the book in my hand right now. Oh, Romanism you have it. And the Reformation, Great. H. Grattan Guinness, yep. Yeah, so the fifth lecture... Um, I don't want to give you a page number because it's going to be wrong because I have a different, I have an old copy. Um, sure. It's newer than the one that I sent to York Glissman, but still it's an old copy and it's going to have a different page number. But um, it's lecture five. It's around page 110 maybe. And it's some paragraphs in there. I mean, this is really important reading the whole book is. But uh, what's really interesting about this is it explains the historical account of, you know, the gospel. And that's really where it's at. It's a really hard study for most people because they just don't take the time to do it, you know. And it's really not that hard, actually. It's not as hard as people make it out to be. It's like the old King James version of the Bible, Daryl. I have a friend of mine who lives uh, out west from here where I live in in central Minnesota. He lives near St. Cloud. And in St. Cloud, Minnesota, um, it's very close to where he grew up. And he grew up with a lot of Roman Catholics. I mean, there are tons of Roman Catholics in Minnesota. But 
St. Joseph, St. Cloud, that area is just caked full of them. And he grew up with lots and lots of Catholics. So he was telling me that I'm, you know, I, I can't understand the King James. Well, I think it's a matter of I don't want to understand the King James, because if you really want to understand the King James, it's not that hard. Right, Daryl? No, it's not. And, and actually, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, ah, Luke, and John. here he is. I'm Look, sorry, am I interrupting something? Not at all. Not at all. We were just discussing uh, part 15 of Romanism and the Reformation that I uploaded to my ah, channel. Yeah. And because we lecture. didn't have an appointment, right? Yeah, yeah. We just thought we'd go in and go for it. Oh, okay, wonderful. But uh, yeah, we didn't have an appointment, so oh, I was didn't. out more oh, lowing yeah, the yeah, morn, yeah. you know. Ah, gotcha. Right, yeah. right, right. I'm just back now. Sorry yeah, I'm mowing that. the lawn, <laughs> and Daryl is shoveling snow like crazy. You're and mowing the lawn on ice, literally skating on ice. What a crazy world! Eh? Is that right? You're, you're I actually was, mowing I was, the lawn? I was mowing my lawn, yeah. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't even find mine. Oh, I can't even <laughs> fathom that. Sheesh. Mine's wow. under a bunch of snow and ice and freezing oh, rain. Oh, man. We're, we're in the tundra land, man. <laughs> Since Yerk is a, is a linguist, um, can I give him my greeting? Of course. Moin, moin, Herr Glissman, und guten Tag, wie geht es Ihnen? Or, oh. as we say in Russian, dobry din, tovarish Glissman, kak wisi vonya pashivayetya, which, folks, in German and English means uh, good day to you, how are you doing in German and Russian. What a wonderful introduction that is. Thank you so much, Daryl. I feel so warmly welcome now. All right. And so then, should we should we do a a a, a session of uh, the divine program of the world's history, you guys? Well, it, uh, that would be that's very your short. call. It'd that be would short. Be very short on yeah on on terms because I thought maybe when you are there, Brett, yeah. we could do this this evening at eight ah, o'clock. Ah, ah, that was the misunderstanding. I thought that might be the case. I really did, but. I no. thought, you know, Daryl, as long as you're there and you got all the energy, let's just go for it. And, you know, we were talking about this lecture five. Yeah, you, know, you, you two guys, you can record something. I'm just here in the background, not doing okay, anything. Cool. And when you're recording, I'm just there. So Sounds good. No, no problem. Yeah, I'm but drinking we were, my coffee. We were just drinking. Or we, <laughs> I was drinking coffee, too. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, I had some in front of me here. But, yeah, um. It's really, really, I mean, it just hit me really, really spot on yesterday when I was listening to this part 15 of Tom reading uh, the pre-Reformation interpreters. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, lecture number five, right? And uh, some paragraphs the 15? in. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Part 15 of that um 30-part series that you made. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, but you're talking about lecture number. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, and that's just a great little video you made. I must say that really, really was very, um, and of course, Tom's reading. I mean, you just can't beat it because Tom's got quite a grip on this book. He's read it mm -hmm. many times. But what he was saying that hit me so hard was that you know, when we talk about the first century church and we talk about Protestantism, it's not Protestantism that we should be talking about. It's historicism. It's historicism. It's the historical account, really, right? Yeah, yesterday, my reading of Romanism at the Reformation, but I was in lecture number seven, I made it again um, the point that to me, it shouldn't even be called the Reformation. It should have been called the roots of, uh, or the root of Protestantism. Because the synagogue of Satan, the Roman Catholic Church, is not, to, is not reformable in any way, shape, or form. So why should you call it Reformation when it is 
<clears throat> it is a work that you can never start on, and, and even if you start on it, you can never finish it. There's no Reformation. It is the founding of Protestantism. That's what I thought is a much better term. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, and also could be called a continuation of Bible-believing Christianity, which was in existence before the Roman Catholic Church morphed into existence over three centuries later. And we were talking about this before you came in, York, is that there were many Christian groups before the Roman Catholic Church even came along. There were the Bogomils, there were the Paulicians, and of course we know about the Albigensian Christians, the Waldensian Christians, the Bohemian Christians, but we often forget to mention, as Richard uh, Bennett's website is carrying, was carrying as its featured video, but it's already off there, but he, the real St. Patrick, and we talked, uh, Brett and I were talking about this earlier, and that is, is that the Celtic Christians the real St. Patrick and his uh, Columbanus and others that were up there in the, in the northern parts of then Great Britain, and of course the Roman Empire had come up so far into Great Britain, but these Celtic Christians established monasteries like St. Patrick, the so-called St. Patrick, but the real Patrick, and they weren't monasteries in the Roman Catholic mold. These were Bible training schools, basically Bible seminaries that trained men in the Bible, and these men went out, these Celtic Christians, and they evangelized most of Western Europe before the Roman Catholic Church even got up into those areas. They evangelized the Germanic tribes, many of them, they, uh, the Franks, the French uh, tribes and that. Uh, these were the original evangelical Christians that evangelized Western Europe, Celtic, Bible-believing Christians in the mold of the real Patrick, in the mold of Columbanus and others, and we could give bunches of names, but these were a bunch of Bible-believing Celtic Christians that went down and basically evangelized what they called the barbarians, the barbarian tribes that later sacked Rome, but these Celtic Christians evangelized them, and then the Roman Catholic Church, when it got had enough power and brought part of the Roman Empire's army along with it, then they forcibly, forcibly converted a lot of, it was convert or die, just it was in Croatia in 1941 through 1945, convert or die, what the Roman Catholic Ostashi told uh, many of the Orthodox Christians to do was you either become a Roman Catholic or you get your throat slit on the spot. And they did, they, even some of the people that converted still got their throat slit. But the, the fact of the matter was that, that they did that to the same thing to the Celtic Christians, uh, especially in the Great Britain and Ireland area. They gave them a choice of convert or die. And so they basically squashed a good bit of the, what we would call primitive Christianity, the early Celtic Christian church, and they, they squashed it under the, the might of the pagan Roman Empire that was still had its armies out there. But then we know what happened, uh, that uh, it morphed into a papal Rome, which papal Rome basically moved into the power vacuum when uh, they moved uh, the headquarters of the empire from from Rome uh, to Constantinople, which is today called Istanbul, which is a whole nother story. But uh, these Celtic Christians, like the real Patrick, they were the ones that evangelized a good bit of Western Europe. Mm -hmm. Any comments from either of you? Yes, I sure I do have a, a few nice quotes on the subject of uh, Reformation and Protestantism. One is Pentecost formed the church, popery deformed it, Protestantism reformed it. That's a nice way to say it, huh? Sure is. Mm -hmm. The Jesuitical lie of futurism is the victory of Romanism over Protestantism. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's the truth, isn't it? The ecumenical movement ends in the capitulation of Protestantism. In a word... And I think that is from James Edgar Wiley. Yeah, is from James Edgar Wiley. In a word, 
Protestantism, Protestantism is a revived Christianity after the adoption by the pagan Roman Empire. That is from James Edgar Wiley. And I think there are no more better words to capture in a little small sentence what Protestantism really is. It is revived Christianity. It is a, it is a return. Mm -hmm. It is a return to apostolic Christianity. Yeah. The problem with the term apostolic Christianity is that that is also hijacked by the Roman Catholic Church. Yep. And therefore, many people have a different understanding of what apostolic Christianity actually means. But after huh. all... Yeah, I, I can't blame them either because we've been so corrupted by this Roman Catholic view. Yeah, because they all believe in this uh, BS lie. Yeah, I, I have. I don't have other words for it. Of mm. uh, of Simon Peter was the first pope. That's right. And of course, when you go through the book Romanism and the Reformation, like Tom has and like I have done, because I have read the book in the meantime three times in English and uh, one time, even if not, but not totally, of, of course not completely in German, because it is not completely translated. Uh, we still need to do lecture eight. That is the last time, the, the last part that has to be translated. Um, no, I lost my train of thought here. That's okay. Uh, and, and you know, this is a really, really important topic, actually. And I think that uh, it's it's really a good timing to get the message uh, yeah, out. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah I, I got it again. I was on the, uh, on the Simon Peter subject. Right. Please go right in Romanism and in, in Romanism and the Reformation. It is very is made very clear by Henry Gretton Guinness that the time of the twelve hundred sixty day year, day year prophecy, the time of the prophecy in Daniel, which speaks about a time times and half a time, uh, the forty two months, the three and a half years, the one thousand two hundred three score days, that that starts in 606 slash 607 because it was at the change of the year in that time 606 607 mm -hmm. therefore and he writes that in these words therefore pope boniface the third was the first pope that's right that's everybody exactly before was right. just a bishop of rome that's right you got it so there goes your quote unquote apostolic succession. There goes your fable of Peter was the first pope. And by the way, when you speak of apostolic succession, let me not laugh, but let me like make that very clear. Apostolic succession means that the dying pope lays his hand upon his successor and by that gives him the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the idea of apostolic succession, all right? Well, <laughs> When, when, <laughs> even if it's tr if it were true, <laughs> I can't help but laugh yeah. about these Roman Catholic guys. But listen, even if it were true, they crucified Peter upside down in Rome. How would he have done and and laid his hand on his successor and giving the Holy Spirit the moment he dies? How would any one of these damnable popes, Antichrist, would have done that? Who bought their office with simony? I mean, this is so ridiculous when you just have two working neurons in your head yep. to to see that that is all just a lie. It is nothing else but Roman Catholic oh, fable. But you're, you know, this is the problem in this world. People see the lucre of the Roman Catholic Church and they go, "Oh, we can be as gods." <laughs> yeah, they do. They give in. And then they lead their whole family in. And then they're all taken. So if you're one of those poor children that was taken, the only way you can get out of this is to just leave. Sadly, leave your family, leave all of them. Just get out of there. Because they're in captivity. And those that lead in captivity must go in captivity. Those that kill by the sword must be killed by the sword. That's how it works. Yeah. I was led captive too. The Lutheran Church is no exception. Oh, we all have been. Right? Yep. We all have been. 
We all have been taken by our nose like an ox yep, by the ring right, to the in slaughter. his nose. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> before anyone accuses us of Catholic bashing, I would, <laughs> like to say a few, <laughs> I would like to say a few things, because number one is my dad was Roman Catholic for till he died. He was uh, at least on the books as a Roman Catholic. My I married a Roman Catholic, precious Roman Catholic lady. Ninety percent of my uncles and aunts are Roman Catholics. Ninety percent of my beloved first cousins are Roman Catholic. My best friend was a Roman Catholic who, thank God, began to read the Bible, the King James Bible, by the way, and got gloriously saved. He got he was he turned to Christ instead of a church t- to find his true Messiah, his true anointed one, the true son of God, not going through a priest, not going through a church, not going through a Eucharistic minister, which he was, not going through a cardinal, not going through a pope. But having said that, and I took Roman Catholic catechism courses, a course uh, when I was up at uh, in Syracuse, New York, studying uh, Russian under the auspices of the United States Air Force, and I took, uh, but I never converted to Catholicism. But the the fact of the matter is, is that like Brett, there I live in a sea of Roman Catholicism, and there are nuns, monks, a lot of Franciscans. Uh, fortunately, no Jesuits that I can identify because a lot of them are not identifiable. But uh, we have uh, my little dinky area of southwest central Pennsylvania has a college in a dinky little town, my dinky little town in southwest central Pennsylvania. And we have a university less than, I think, eight miles away, uh, a Roman Catholic university, which, by the way, we have uh, quite a few Muslims going to the, the Roman Catholic college and in my hometown and the Roman Catholic University down the road, about eight miles or more. And um, isn't that interesting? A lot of uh, Muslims, a lot of uh, Saudi Arabians and that to come over here. Uh, that's a whole nother story. But the, the fact of the matter is, is this isn't. And please, if you're a Catholic listener is tuning in, I obviously didn't hate my dad. I didn't hate my wife. I didn't hate all of my cousins. and. Uh, my uncles and aunts, and I still love them. And uh, I have many friends that are indeed Roman Catholics. They need to get out of that church, just like if you're a Roman Catholic listener, you need to get out of your church. It's the same as the Lutherans and the Methodists and many of the Southern Baptists and that. You need to get out of organized religion and get studying your Bible, praying, and get in a a personal relationship with the Son of God and studying the Bible, which is the operating manual for the human soul. So this is an important point to make. And uh, Richard Bennett, by the way, whom we talk about fairly frequently, he's 80 years old, former Dominican priest of 22 years, who puts up a lot of uh, great YouTube videos. And that Richard Bennett has a great heart. And, And Brett and I were talking about this earlier before you came in, York. Richard Bennett, being a former Roman Catholic and a former Roman Catholic priest of Dominican of 22 years, has a great love for Roman Catholics. He witnesses to Roman Catholics, but he does it out of love for Roman Catholics, calling on them to come out of her, my people, as God's people are commanded in Revelation 18.4, God says, come out of her, my people, you, you be, and I don't have this one memorized, but you, the, you be not partaker in her plagues and that, and her, the judgments and that that are going to come upon her, for sure, because God tells you, he's going to punish what we would call, what Revelation, the book, the Bible book of Revelation chapters 13 through 18, vividly outlined who the historic Antichrist is. And, uh, and also outlines the church, so-called. Uh, it's actually a religious, financial, geopolitical juggernaut called Papal Rome, which I should say Jesuit-controlled Papal Rome. God says, get the heck out of Dodge, as we say in the western parts of the United States. You, we need to 
get out of any organized religious system that puts barriers between people and coming to God through their true Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and not through a church, not through a priest, not through Mary, not through anyone else, not being mean here, but they just need to get out of those religious systems, and they just need to, again, study the Bible and pray, ask God to show you from his holy word for English-speaking people, the old King James Bible, show you the truths of his word, and believe me, you will find them. And again, we were just mentioning also that much of the King James is very, very easy to understand. The few archaic words, the fact that they use thee and thou and thine, you know, almost every language in the world has a you singular and a you plural. And I saw that in French. I saw that in Russian. I saw it in Arabic. Arabic even has a dual. But these other languages have a familiar or singular you, in other words, thou, the, thine, and they have a plural, like you, ye, in English. They ha- that way you can tell when you're talking to one person or if you're talking to five people. And sometimes in translating, that's important to know whether you're uh, a certain command of God or a word of God in his word, his real word, not a word that you get after eating a pizza with anchovies and sardines on it. But uh, the word of God that comes from his word, that is the word that we need to get from the, the true Bible. And again, in the English for English speaking people, it's the old King James. It's very easy to understand. The gospels are extremely easy to understand. A few archaic words that are in there, most of them are self-explanatory later on. The King James Bible interprets itself in some verses, like it says, sweep with the, the besom. That word is another word for broom. I mean, but it, you get the meaning of it from the context, sweep with a besom. Okay, so it's a broom. So much of it is, almost all of it is very easy to understand, and especially the gospel. So I, I really, really urge people to, to really study the old King James Bible that is a verbatim translation and that it uses the correct Hebrew Masoretic for its Old Testament translation and it uses the, for its New Testament translation, it uses over 5,000 manuscripts and papyri that agree with each other. And um, it uses those with a verbatim, in other words, a word for word or formal equivalence translation. And that is extremely important. It's not a paraphrase. It's not dynamic equivalence translation. So they're using the right manuscripts and they're using the correct translation techniques. And how do you get a good Bible if you don't even, use, if you don't even have the correct manuscripts to start out with, no matter how good your translators are? So Can I those say are something key there? points. Yep, I know I got on a roll there. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, always, it's always a little bit of a problem to, 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 to get a word in between when you are speaking, but that's okay. Um, because everything you say is so correct and it has to be said, you know. The only thing I wanted to mention is I am as a not native English speaker. I'm a German native English speaker, and I never was very good in English in school. Oh, you're very good, but go ahead. But I, but I adopted English really as my second language, mm-hmm. even though I live in Belgium and I have to speak Dutch. Mm-hmm. So actually, I'm speaking three languages, and I can use them interchangeably. But the point is... Um, The King James Version of the Bible, with the these and the thous and that stuff that you said in the beginning, some people call that archaic. I call that much more differentiated, Mm -hmm. much more to the point to who is addressed and how the people are addressed than when you just use you, as we do today. The these and the thous, for me, they they don't only sound nice. They are nice words. That is nice English, and that is so self-explaining. I, as not an English native speaker, never, ever had once the problem that I did not understand what he meant with these and those and ye and yea and all that stuff. No problem at all. And I am not the smartest bulb burning there 
<laughs> yeah. On the ceiling, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's 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 kind of one of these things you're that you know when you when you end up um being a uh, idolater, let's just say. Uh you're a music lover. You know, I was in this position for a very long time until I started noticing these offensive lyrics and it just grew into more and more of an offense. And then I finally realized that this has nothing to do with God at all. And why am I listening to this crap? And it really started making me angry and I just had to throw the stuff out. I want it to go to the dump. I want it to rot. I don't want to sell it to someone else because I know they're going to get in bondage like I was. You know, the problem is, Brett and Daryl, we are speaking today a degenerated English. Exactly. We are speaking today a degenerated German. We yes. are speaking today a degenerated Dutch. And that's why we try to make everything bad that was earlier because, oh, they were stupid. They were so living so many years ago. They couldn't have been smarter than us. No, I have just read and completed 800 pages of the book of Carl Theodor Griesinger on the history of the Jesuits, a book that even Eric John Phelps used as basis and a research book when he wrote his book, Vatican Assassins. Yeah. Sometimes Griesinger writes a sentence over half a page, for God's sake. That's right. Where do you have that eloquent expression in your language today? You know, it is not because... Pe I, I, Mrs. Eisabite wrote a book, The Deliberately Dumbing Down of, your, of America. Yeah. She could have called it the deliberate dumping down of the whole world. Mm -hmm. People are right. so dumped down, they don't even see intelligence anymore. They don't even, uh, they don't even recognize intelligent reading anymore. Yeah, Yerk, I have that book, and it's as big as a Philadelphia telephone book. <laughs> I got the PDF a, version. That is a large book. It's pretty heavy. It's not quite Charlotte as big Eisenbite. as Eric John Phelps's book, Vatican Charlotte Assassins. Yeah. But boy, yeah, she wrote quite a book. She wrote quite a book there. Um, and I agree 100% with what Yerk just said, because I've got all these, I mean, yeah. I've got a lot, dozens and dozens of books, uh, not just about the Jesuits, but I've got dozens and dozens of books that are optically scanned, uh, print-on-demand books that I get from my local Barnes & Noble when I go down there. And I have uh, these books by like Dowling and... Uh, Samuel F. B. Morse, the inventor of the telegraph and Morse code. Um, I've got all these different books from the 1800s and uh, early 1800s sometimes. And these books were written by gentlemen whose English vocabulary is probably over double to three times the English vocabulary of most Americans today. In other words, they can run circles pretty much around almost all of us because <laughs> yeah. they they had uh, they really studied a lot of books and they read a lot and of course they read the Bible but they also read quite a few other books and these men again and when I read through their books I have to grab a dictionary sometimes including my old I think it's a uh, I forget what year, the 1828, I think it was, when uh, Webster's um, dictionary, dictionary came, came out. Came out. And yep. it is tremendous because it uses, for example, Bible verses and that. But uh, these men wrote with at least double to triple the vo vocabulary uh, that most of uh, us Americans today, York's not included in that grouping, but us, Amer we Americans, uh, we have a very limited vocabulary. Yeah, we've got some modern terms and we've got some technological terms and stuff that, that uh, people from the 1800s wouldn't recognize. But they used a lot of liter literary terms and other vocabulary words that, again, they could run circles around us. So, yeah, a lot of those books from the early, especially the early to mid 1800s, and even up through almost the late 1800s, uh, these gentlemen, that, and mostly they were men, but uh, these people that back in those times that wrote had vocabularies that were much larger than the vocabularies that we have. 
Yeah, that's true. Any comment? And, you know, I gotta say something. Oh here yeah, too. a comment. I gotta say something right very fast because please go and, ahead. Your you go first. Sorry, keep keep it in mind, please. What you want to say, Brad? Uh, one of these weeks in our Bible study, we were studying the book of James, and I was so looking forward to come to chapter two because I really wanted to make a point that I'm going to make right here, right now. James chapter two, verse three says, "And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing." Mm -hmm. And say unto him, sit thou here in a good place. And say to the poor, stand thou there or sit here under my footstool. The point I want to make is the word gay. And ye have respect to him that weareth gay clothing. That word had a completely different meaning 150 years ago. Right. And of course, at the time of the writing of the King James Bible. It was a yeah. nice word, people. It was a good word. Today, it is a curse word, and it is a word that is only used to speak about the quote-unquote homosexual, or as I like to call it, the sodomite abomination. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful word in the English language. And when you are today, try to use it in that way, the people look at you like you have two hats, oh, because they yeah. just don't get it. Now, you that know? fits perfectly with what I want to say, Yerk, if you don't Okay, mind. then, please say what you want to say, bro. Oh, well, you know, I'm a musician. I have a lot of musician friends. What is it that music rides on? What, what is the motor behind music? Well, dare I say it's ideology. And ideology can be used as a tool, just like finance can be used as a tool. And ideology has been used to dumb down this world and to change meanings of words, and to make things mm -hmm. popularized, and have people dance around singing all this crap about destroying the truth. Because that's what happened. And you have every right to be upset about it, and we ought to start doing something about it. And that's what these studies are all about. They're about clarifying what these terms are and why we're in the position we're in today, in the church and in the state, both. And it's clear as a bell now. And there's no reason to be silent about it anymore, right? Right. So, yeah, I get really upset. When my old friends are, are just, you know, kind of like giving up the spirit of, of reading their Bibles because they're too hard. Come on, man. You don't know what the scripture says yet. Faith comes by what? Hearing, right? Hearing. Mm -hmm. And hearing comes by the reading of the word of God. That's right. So if you start with that kind of attitude, you're already dead. Isn't it just hey, um, wonderful? Isn't it just wonderful how God is capable? I mean, he's capable mm -hmm. of everything. Let's <laughs> take away that. But how he is capable of writing a few hundred pages, and within these few hundred pages, he gives you an answer to every question you would ever like to ask him. Hey guys, this old guy with uh, that's me, by the way. <laughs> as of course, points out to me, seventy-one <laughs> years old. He is balancing a, about a 40-pound book on his lap here, holding a phone with his stroke hand, trying to his ear, say, here's gay. Here's what uh, Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, which is a great dictionary. Number one, merry, airy, jovial, sportive, frolicsome. It denotes more life and animation than cheerful. Fine, second meaning, showy as a gay dress. Inflamed or merry with liquor. Well, we don't like that one. Intoxicated. Yeah, right. But anyway, yeah. you get the you get the two primary meanings of the old uh, Noah Webster's dictionary. I think it's eighteen twenty eight, which I'm trying to balance again on my lap. But merry is the primary meaning. Sure. Cheerful. You know, it's it's that's what it it was, and they talked about the, a gay time in the old town tonight and stuff like that. They didn't mean anything to do with the sodomites. It That's right. It meant Mary. M-E-R-R-Y. 
Yeah, M E R R Y, not M A R Y. <laughs> like Maryland, the yeah. state that's right we below me. We talk about me. that a lot. Yeah, that's right. Maryland. Big difference there. Mary, M E R R Y. That means like when you're happily married to be mm-hmm. merry, you know, when things just fit in the right place. It doesn't always last. That's true. You know, I've never been through a marriage myself, but uh, I've seen, you know, uh, the effects of this, this, uh, this incredibly strange day and age we live in where it's popularized to go watch movies like Kramer versus Kramer. That's enough to make a child just completely give up. And that's what happened to me. I saw that and I thought, marriage? Pfft, what's that? Well, yeah, the uh, a very, very, very evil forces in in the world, and I especially we've seen it here in the United States of America, have undermined the the biblical role of the husband within the the family as a father and the uh, the wife's role, women's and men's role have been turned on their head and especially here in the United States of America. Yep. And so Bingo. we have a society Thanks to Alice Bailey and all them other occult mm-hmm. people. Yeah. yeah. And we plan went we've through developed, and they succeeded. It's incredible and, how how wicked this is. And the people just it, buy it. And they continue and the primary, to buy it, don't they? Yep, and the primary objective of all this was to undermine the biblical foundations of the family. Satan wants to destroy the family as a unit, and that's why we've got people like Ms. Clinton, Hillary Clinton, saying it takes a village. to. What they want is socialism, communism, to raise your child, the so-called village. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind, that they want to undermine uh, men's roles and women's roles, mix them together, confuse things. To the point where we're not even in America, we're, we have people that aren't even sure what their gender is or what they want it to be, and that they try to make changes in that. Uh, everything is pointed to pulling away from God's idea for men and women and for marriage. And of course, we have the, um, the so called uh, um, church, this uh, Roman Catholic church, uh, putting this horrible celibacy upon not only their priests, but the, the nuns. And I, there are lots of priests and nuns and monsignors running all around where I live here. That's not, that's not God's plan for the family. And we pointed this out before. The Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which can be found in the, again, in the old King James Bible, in the book of Titus, his epistle to Titus, And his epistle, uh, I believe it's 1 Timothy, he lays out the different offices within the church and what the qualifications are. And, of course, he only has really two positions. He has a bishop slash elder, and and it's not a bishop that wears a a, 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 a hat, the hat of Dagon, uh, that we find in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, financial a geopolitical juggernaut, but it's 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 the bishop slash elder, or it's the deacon. Those are the two offices got there. All the rest, we're all brethren, and we don't have this cardinal, archbishop, bishop thing promoted anywhere in the Holy Bible. We're told that we're all brethren. We're all to be brothers, and that's why a lot of the early Christians called themselves brothers and sisters. But the qualifications, Paul lays them out, and nowhere does he say you're to be celibate. Paul says uh, the the qualifications of a bishop slash elder, or for a deacon, is married to one wife, having his children under subjection. In other words, having them under discipline, because how can someone who can't rule his own family rule within the church? So he lays out the qualifications in two different places under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he says the qualifications are for a bishop slash elder and a deacon, 
married to one wife having children under discipline. Where in there do we find celibacy? Celibacy and forced mandatory celibacy is nowhere, nowhere to be found in the true Bible. It's just not there. And we see in America, they especially, with all of the, not only the pedophile priests, but as uh, uh, William H. Kennedy, he wrote Lucifer's Lodge, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Catholic Church. This is a Roman Catholic writer, folks, who died a mysterious death, like many people that write books like he does. He died a mysterious death, uh, a premature death, probably. But William H. Kennedy said, as bad as the pedophilia problem is, the abuse of boys, the teenage boys especially, um, young teenage boys in America is, he says, far, far, far bigger problem. And he says, this one isn't talked about much, is the abuse of women, including nuns, within the official Roman Catholic Church. He says that is an even bigger problem. And I've probably got six or seven different books written mostly by Roman Catholics trying to expose this horrible problem of the abuse of women, not just boys, women and young girls, and to include nuns uh, within the United States of America. Massive, massive epidemic level problem in the United States of America. Again, some courageous Roman Catholic writers, and I'd have to go down to my basement to find the books, but I've got some, like, oh, 708-page books in that, 600-page books that are all by Roman Catholic writers and are documenting in great detail the horrible, horrible abuse of women and girls by the Roman Catholic Church's uh, prelates and priests I'm and even mother superiors. Yeah, go ahead, Derek. You're I'm doing a whole series on that subject in German. Uh, I call that playlist Systematic Catholic Child Abuse. I have already produced 13 videos, of which I have four or five uploaded up to now. And um, I'm going into articles from presenceofgodministry.org, who speaks about we saw nuns kill children. Uh, I go yeah. into the I go into the original records of the trials that have been made, uh, hundreds of pages long, and we are going to translate all that into German. But of course, everybody can look that because it's originally in English. Um, the very first six videos I use just to lay the foundation to get the people understand that not only child abuse, but also sodomy and every other kind of abu abuse. Because, you know, yes. even when you are above 18 years old, you still are a child because we are yes. all children of our Heavenly Father. Yeah, The distinction, yeah. To, to, to make the distinction between children and grown-ups is just something that we have here in this world because our Father sees us all as His children, Right. So right. even when you, when you are abusing a 25-year-old or a 64-year-old, you are still abusing a child of God. You're always yes. doing child abuse. Yeah. So what I did with these first six videos in German was to lay the foundation to tell the people where are the roots of this systematic child abuse. That's because I called the playlist and the video systematic Catholic child abuse. If it is systematic, it has to be some mm -hmm. kind of a foundation. And the foundation is first and for all to be found in the not recognition of the Roman Catholic Church of the second uh, commandment. But idolatry and a superstitious religion that is on the basis of that because people are getting depraved when they worship idolatry. And that is what Romans chapter 1 is dealing all about, at least from verse 15 through 32 on. And I, it took me six videos and a lot of papers from Richard Bennett, who mm -hmm. 
uh, produced a few papers that I then translated into German, so you can look that up on Richard Bennett's website, because, you know, Daryl is promoting him every, every five seconds anyway, so go to that <laughs> website <laughs> and have a look, and I translated all that, and I got it translated by my German friends, because I didn't translate it, but I got a few German brothers to translate that stuff for me into German, and read in six parts and made it so clear that there is a a root in the Roman Catholic Church that makes it impossible for the Roman Catholic Church not to uh, not to have ab abuse, right. child abuse. That's right. Um, Grown-up abuse, abuse in any kind of way. It is it is what what identifies the Roman Catholic Church. That's what people have to get in between their ears. The Roman Catholic Church cannot do anything else because it is their nature. Yes, their nature yes. is abuse. Let's inject a little humor into this uh, our, uh, subject, and that is is that Yerk used hyperbole there. Uh, he exaggerated. I don't promote Richard Bennett every five seconds. It's every six or seven seconds. So, <laughs> so, so York ought to ease up on this old 72 year old guy. That's old enough to be his father yeah, or yeah, his yeah. uncle. Huh? Huh? Nephew. That's right. <laughs> I think it was nephew quite Brett. possible for you to, to, to hear the sarcasm. Out yes. Of my uncle Daryl. Right? <laughs> All right. Awesome. I call, we call each other uncle and nephew back and forth sometimes. Because I am old enough. I thought I was only 12 years older, but but Brett <laughs> reminded me that I was 20 years older. Yeah, that's okay. Or more. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, Daryl. No, but I do want to emphasize again that this is an important subject. And that book by William H. Kennedy, who passed on, passed away. Uh, uh, William H. Kennedy, by the way, a Roman Catholic, again, writer wrote a tremendous book and it's called you have to do a it's out of print you'll have to look for an old copy do a an internet search for it but lucifer's lodge satanic ritual abuse in the in the catholic church tremendous tremendous book i have that one somewhere down in the basement also mm. but uh william h kennedy is his name and mm. you might want to Google search that and try to find that book, because if you can get a used copy of that book, I urge you to get it, because he really brings out not only the problem with so-called pedophilia, but he also brings out the abuse of women and girls is even bigger in his mind than the abuse of boys in America. And that's saying quite a bit, because there's we've had, especially here in my area, southwest Pennsylvania, we had the Johnstown Altoona Archdiocese. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, no convictions to the best of my knowledge. Uh, these guys all, many, the statute of limitations always seems to run out, or they buy off, but they bought off a lot of the people with a brown bag full of cash. Uh, they call it the bag man comes around and bribes a lot of these people that are considering bringing lawsuits but when a lawsuit does get brought it just gets buried and or it dies the death of the statue of limitations runs out but a lot of times the people are threatened we've had no like in up in the, i think in the was in the boston area somewhere in massachusetts or new england they found one of these guys that was uh who had been abused by priests and he was bringing a lawsuit, and he, he, they tried to buy him off. He wouldn't be bought off, so he was found floating face down in a river. Don't think that doesn't happen in America today. It does happen. They will kill people sometimes when they say, back off, and the people don't back off, and they murder them, period. And again, some of these people, some of these Catholic writers, Malachi Martin, uh, and again, we're not promoting any of these people. We're just saying they spoke out about, against some of the abuse that was in the Roman Catholic Church. They died premature deaths. I think William H. Kennedy died a pre premature death. And I think people know what I mean when I say premature death. <clears throat> Their natural death that they might have died a year later, two years, three years later, someone speeds it up with a fast acting cancer or by drowning them in a river. Etc. There, that just stuff happens way too often 
in the uh, good old United States of America, and I, I'm an American, and I served in my, you know, the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Army for a total of 20 years. So, you know, I love what my country used to be. I love what it used to stand for, but I don't like what's going on today. And, and uh, I served my 20 years, so I have a right under uh, not only God, but under the U.S. Constitution, I know it's been trashed and everything, to speak out. Uh, the Bill of Rights that we were given were a pretty good deal that were written down. They're not enforced anymore. But uh, we have a right to speak out, and we should speak out. We have a duty to speak out, and not That's just right. from any Constitution or any Declaration of Independence or anything like that. Mm -hmm. We have a duty to speak out because God commands us to speak out. And he says in Ephesians 5, 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That means expose them, bring them to the light, shine the light on them, shine the spotlight on it. Just like the reformers did, just like even centuries before the reformers right. came along, the Celtic Christians, but especially all of the reformers, they didn't agree on everything, but one thing they all, the top reformers agreed on, the Puritan scholars all agreed on, was that the office of the papacy was the historic Antichrist. They weren't looking for a future Antichrist after everyone's allegedly, supposedly been fictional in the fictional, according to the fictional story, have been uh, air evacuated out of, off of, of this uh, a world uh, by a pre-tribulation rapture, uh, the historic position on who the Antichrist is and who the harlot, the whore religious system is, is clearly outlined, especially in, for the whore, the harlot system is outlined in Revelation chapters 13 through 18. When you read that, and it, I don't know how anyone can read that with an open mind, asking the Lord to show them the truth of the matter. Revelation interprets itself, by the way, mm -hmm. in many places, that if you ask God to show you who the real Antichrist is, I don't know how you can't come to the same conclusion that all of these so-called Protestant reformers came to the conclusion that the papacy was the historic Antichrist, the office of the papacy, and that the religious system, the Babylonian, the old Babylonian religious system that took became Roman Catholicism, how that isn't on the pages of chapters 13 through 18. I don't know how people can read their Bibles and not see that, but we do know a pastor that, that preaches the King James Bible, and he still can't see it. He still can't see it that he can't see who the pap he can't see who the antichrist is and the antichrist is standing right in front of him as richard bennett who i promote every 5 seconds as richard bennett points out quite vividly when he stood in papal rome and he he was this is when he well, was still a dominican uh, uh priest he looked and he was in rome and he looked and he says i looked around me and there's all these guys in purple and there's all these guys in scarlet and he thought light bulbs started going off in his head or whatever. And he said, uh, gee, I think that's in Revelation, you know, dressed in scarlet and purple. And that's what the colors of these higher level prelates, the Roman Catholic cardinals and the Roman Catholic bishops slash archbishops. Those are the colors that they wear. Type in purple and scarlet colors and, and into your uh, search engine on the internet and take a look at all the pictures that come up of Roman Catholic prelates. Prelates are high level uh, priests basically, but the very high, highest level ones, the bishops and the arch slash archbishops and the cardinals, they were scarlet and purple. So again, the Bible very clearly lays out who the Babylonian religious whore is of, of, uh, of history. And it also lays out who the uh, Antichrist is. And it's very clearly, as the reformers all agreed, it's the office of the Pope in the Popes or the office of the papacy within the Roman Catholic Church. So that's something that 
that uh, uh, Brett and Norman and Yerk Glissman and Tom Fress have been bringing out for quite a while on their YouTube, I call them YouTubers, their YouTube sessions, the videos that they post and uh, their YouTube channels. They bring that point out in spades. They bring it out, they're spot on and identify using the historicist, the historical prophetic position as opposed to the preterist and the futurist positions that are Jesuit inventions, that are Jesuit creations designed to get the proverbial spotlight off of the office of the papacy as being the historic anti-Christ. It's black and white on the pages of Holy Scripture in the Old King James Bible. Check it out. Very good, Daryl. Thanks for letting me get that monologue. Yeah, (laughs) I think that we should probably close it up pretty soon because we're an hour and 12 minutes into the session. Sure. And uh, is there any final comments from you, Yerk? I think. Well, well, final comments. Well, you know, you could maybe have final comments if we really had a topic about this, but we were scratching on so many topics i think uh if the attention span of our listeners would not be extended too far we could go on for hours and hours I think we could this. Go so on for hours and hours <laughs> yeah that's right so, so are come you saying through. that we're we all opened we're many all cans. masters of hot wind <laughs> yeah yeah we are but, yep and but, but in a good way because um we've all studied this these topics uh, well, uh, we we could always do a better job on studying, and we could always do a je- better job on presenting it. But the fact of the matter is, is that we've tried to do our homework. And I know that Tom Fress, York Glissman, Brett Norman, and I, we've done some serious homework on these subjects. And we're not trying to be mean to anyone. We just want to get the word out. We want to get truth out. And that's an important thing to do. It sure is. So with that, we'll close it up and we'll catch everyone next time. Can I make one other final Please comment? Please do. Go ahead, Daryl. I want and I want to uh, say this because we brought this up earlier, and that is, uh, any uh, whenever we mention the ministry, whenever we mention anybody that sells videos or anything, I put this in some of my latest uh, newsletters and articles, and that is that if we endorse a certain video, uh, a, a DVD. Uh, a book or something, that's not a blanket endorsement of anybody's ministry or anything. Uh, for example, Pastor Mike Hoggard has uh, two good videos that I really like about uh, Mary, the uh, uh, the idolatry that is seen within the Roman Catholic Church on Mary. So I promote those two videos. I wouldn't necessarily promote some of the other things that that Pastor Hoggard puts out because I think he's he's a futurist and I think Yurk agrees with me in that. Full heartedly. Um, yep, and I yeah, do too. And, sadly. And so does sadly. Brett. And we and we, I feel bad because he's doing a lot of good. He really defends the King James, but he's got a scotoma and he which is a blind spot, a fancy word for a blind spot. He cannot see that the Jesuits have brought this futurist position in and 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 by by um, not taking the historic historicist position, he's actually helping them in that area. And, and I it's hope not that just Mike Hoggard, Daryl. It's all yeah, I know. Kinds There's a lot of, of them. Oh, just endless list. It is and easier. Most of them it is easier it. to it mm-hmm. is easier to speak about the histori- historicists on YouTube or in the internet than mm-hmm. to talk about all those who are not historicists because. Yes. When yeah. you're speaking about the historicists, you actually uh, have enough on one hand, on all the <laughs> fingers that you have on one hand. I'm, I'm yeah, sorry, isn't that a shame? It is no, a you're shame. You're laughing, and you're laughing correctly, but isn't that a shame? No, 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 you're right. Yeah, it's it so is not a laughing matter, actually. That so few people have the understanding of the Bible, that yeah. so few people have the correct understanding of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, which is so clearly... Yep. But everybody goes to the church and just swallows the spoon that the priest yep. feeds him. Yep, it's our seminaries and that that have betrayed a lot of these people. A lot of times they didn't do it 
willingly, but they've still done it through ignorance. Yeah, and like you said earlier, Because they Darryl. won't study their Bibles. They won't yeah. study their Bibles like it's they should. It's these wolves in sheep's clothing that we cannot mm-hmm. see, nor can we figure out unless we try the spirits with them. It's not that easy to, to, to uh, see a wolf in your congregation. You know, it's not that easy. Yeah. Just very quickly, and that is, is that, and I know I'm going to promote something here, but it's, I don't know how much longer it's going to be. For a, about a $120 value, for $30, twenty nine ninety nine, you can get six videos on the Reformation. Again, what I said about, it's not a blanket uh, promotion of any ministry or that, or video company, because these people sell some of C.S. Lewis videos, videos about C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, not good. Uh, and there, So again, you're going to have to pick out the good from the bad, but the, the video package that they're offering for $29.99, I would advise you to get because these six videos, and they're about John Wycliffe, Martin Luther, God's Outlaw, which by the way is the story of William Tyndale, Jan Hus, the, uh, and the Radicals, which are And it's a 30-minute documentary of Zwingli and Calvin. The Radicals is about the Anabaptists. Uh, Those videos, they're all, all six of them, very good for $29.99. Just, I'll just say it one time, uh, www.visionvideo.com. And they have a toll-free order line. I'll only give it once for the visually impaired, 1-800-523-523. 0226. I would urge people to get those six videos and watch them. And if you want to get their catalog, get the catalog, but use discernment and pick the meat out from the bones. Don't just think that they sell everything they sell is good. I think that's true of almost every ministry and organization, Christian so called organization, and especially here in the United States. You need to use discernment. We're not giving a blanket endorsement of hardly anybody except other than the one I give every five seconds, <laughs> and that's to Richard Bennett. I really love that gentleman, and uh, he's such a courageous Christian. So it's, only it's so good to be on seconds. with both of you. <laughs> so good to be on with both of you yeah. again. Six and we got a lot of truth out, praise there, God. <laughs> yes, Richard Bennett out. is uh, an amazing uh uh, website he has and, and a ministry he has and, and the message he has. Uh, incredible how uh, yes. these, these men have come out even in high ranks, uh, you know, such as Alberto Rivera, who has gotten a lot, oh, yes. of, a lot of flack. I mean, wow. And of course, he's long gone. He's, what was it, in the 80s he died or something, 90s, I forget. Maybe even early 2000s, I can't even remember. But uh, yeah, I mean, these people uh, that come out of the Roman Catholic Church uh, and start telling the truth about the Roman Catholic Church are just, as far as I'm concerned, pure gold. And they ought to be uh, listened to. And, you know, it's not like, any one of us or anyone else is perfect in every single way because you can pick apart all the doctrine till, you know, I mean, none of us are going to be as Christ was. Just forget it. But what we can do is point the finger to the Roman Catholic whore and say, come out of her, my people, all you institutional people and and uh, people that uh, wish to stay in congregations, you ought to really start taking it seriously. You know, come to this knowledge of the truth that can set you free. Because if you stay in bondage to that system of sin, you're going to go down with it. And we don't want that to happen to you. We really don't. No, and as I tell my nephew, Brett, quite frequently... (laughs) is that if I can pick a a word for the Roman Catholic, uh, again, geopolitical, religious, financial juggernaut, it is, if you could give me, if you said, define it in two words, serial killers. 
serial killers because every 30 to 50 years, maybe less than that, they go on a mass murder spree. They're guilty of genocide. They, they fomented World War I. They fomented Jesuit control paper Rome, fomented World War I and World War II, period. And that's well documented by uh, Edmund Paris. It's, uh, the World War I is documented by J.A. Kensett that uh, uh, Brett Norman was nice enough to send me that. I didn't know about that. Uh, what is that? Uh, the Rome's responsibility for the Great War or something? Rome's? Yeah, Rome Behind the Great War. That's right. Rome Behind the Great War is sure. a tremendous book. And then, of course, Edmund Paris's book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, that urged the readers. Oh, yeah. To take a look at that. is doing a wonderful reading of that. And I've been finishing that up. And boy, oh, boy, we got something coming. <laughs> so, again, thanks yeah. so much for a great, great um, session, YouTube session here. And, and thank God that we can get together, work together. And each make our own contributions, and hopefully, again, we're I think believe we're all trying to make an effort to do our best to get truth out there. So thank you, thank you uh, to both of you. All right, Daryl, Yerk, did you have something more to say? Well, he says already so much. <laughs> oh, he has already said so much. Um, I don't think it is even appropriate to com comment on that. Um, just to say one last word, maybe when he spoke about um, the serial killers and every 50 or 60 years they go uh, out and um, go on fomenting wars, those are only the open wars. We should never forget all the hidden wars mm -hmm. because we are not speaking of, you know, just the material sort killing us, but we are speaking about the spiritual sort killing us. We are speaking about the battle that we are to fight according to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, that we should put on the whole armor of God. Because there are so many, um, let's say, covered wars in this world. Yes. The, the, the war they do against us by poisoning our nutrition, by poisoning our water, by poisoning our minds through the indoctrinational system of this ratio studiorum, learning against learning of the Medici method the Jesuits introduced yeah. to the to the perfect state as it is today. But this would even this quote unquote ending comment would lead us into just another discussion endlessly mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we could really talk endlessly about that. Mm -hmm, but yeah. we should never ever forget. Don't only mention those wars that you see with your eyes, that you hear with your ears, but also mention these wars that are struggles behind the screen, that are on the spiritual basis, and that kill more people than any war ever did. I mean, let's just face it. The birth control pill for women mm -hmm. oh, killed yeah. more children than every war in the in the human history. Mm -hmm. Yes. And nobody is crying out about that. Yeah, that's right. Very few, very few people. And that's my last words of that for today. <laughs> right. Good good points, Yerk. Very good points, because a lot of wars are covert. They are behind the scenes, but then there's the spiritual warfare behind all that. So, wow, again, thank you to both of you. And thank you for the great job that you both do on the, the graphics and the technical stuff that you guys do that I do not have the capability of doing. And you guys do a great job on putting graphics onto the video, the uh, YouTube session. So sure. thank you both you know, very that's, much. That's just because it's, it's in love and care for all of those that are entangled in this system along with us. You know, we, we're not trying to take any glory for this at all. We're just trying to bring it right back to the Lord because that's where it belongs. It's not for us. It's for him. Right. It's for his purpose. You know, and people always get the wrong impression and think, oh, you're just doing all this music because you want to sell it and you want to make lots of money. No, it's bullshit. Excuse my French. But, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, just... Think about all of the wrongdoing that's going on right now. I mean, it's not just one-dimensional. It's multi-dimensional things that are going on. It's, uh, it's all these, these man-made laws that control right. the monetary system 
that are completely, you know, people are forced to make a living one way or another, and it's through a false system of of uh, of uh, monies, really. Yep. I mean, it's debt. And this has been happening well over 100 years now in America, but that's just America. How about the rest of the world? This has been going right. on for a long, long time. And what did Jesus do in the temple? He fashioned a whip, right? Mm-hmm. And he went Drove after the, the money, money changers, changers man. He was yep. ticked. So we ought to be ticked too, and we ought to do something about it. That's the only message I want to end with here is that, you know, I'm, you know, we're not trying to bring glory to the self. It's all about the Lord. It's about bringing it to his kingdom and not being a part of this world anymore because it's, it's going to go down and it's going to go down harsh. But we got to know that behind that, be, behind our deaths that are going to happen, however they're going to happen, God knows our end from the beginning. And right. we just need to be in that spirit of being grateful that he yep. offered to us his one-time sacrifice, and we accept it. Yeah, and we Gladly. need to be grateful also to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's why I'm not trying to, to tout you guys up. I'm just saying that I appreciate the work that you're doing that I can't do because uh, of the short-term memory loss and everything, learning new things about the graphics. You guys do a good job on the YouTube videos, and that's my final say. And uh, right, Thanks. I didn't mean to get off in a little, a little anger tangent. It's just that, you know, I worked my whole life to, uh, to you know, do something with the music thing, and it's so incredibly disappointing, and, and let's not even get into it. It's just right. not even worth mentioning. But other than to say that, you know, the, the devil knows how to ensnare us, and that's yep. one of his weapons, unfortunately. He's kind of perverted the whole world, you know, right? with this Luciferian system. And it digs very, very deep into all different realms. And it's really bad right now, and, and it doesn't seem like it's going to get any better. I know there's people that think it will, but you know, when you start looking at the Jesuit order and what these politicians are saying about it, it just doesn't look good. Nope, and the Lord says in his word, things will wax worse and worse, and the love of many, so you guys know the Bible passages, the Lord doesn't, he says it's like birth pangs and that. Mm-hmm. Things are going to get worse and worse as far as wars, rumors of wars, and everything else. We know that they plan on doing great evil as they've done in World War One and World War Two. And I think that uh, we may have billions of people instead of millions killed. But we need to remember that. But we remember need to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that's going to reign. And uh, he's going to be the one. He's in control of everything now, despite the fact that these people are doing so much evil. We need to keep that in mind. Again, study the Bible and do prayer. So God bless you, and thank you so much for this session. You're welcome, Daryl. Thanks for having us with you as well, and, and Jörg Glissman in Belgium, for all his time and effort for reading this most intriguing book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, and going off on the tangent of reading the real Odessa and explaining yeah. some of these things. They're, they're not easy for Americans to grasp. I have a very hard time with it, but that's just how it works. Not all of us are, are given the ability to see it right away. It just takes a lot of effort, and you have to want to see the truth. It just doesn't come by uh, automatically. You, you have to seek it out. And that's right. what, what our Bible studies are all about, is seeking out the truth, finding the, the real message the Lord wants us to have for right. eternity, not just now, but for eternity, for eternal life, because that's what we need to keep our eyes focused on Him and His truth and we got to suffer through the rest of this life, no matter what position we're in. And if we don't, then we might be in trouble. So we got to really keep our nose to the grindstone here. 
So God bless everybody. We'll catch up with you soon. Bye-bye for now. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire.